The race is now on for Boise's next mayor, now that we have two official candidates, the current one, and one who has a history with Boise, but who's also not happy with how it's going now. 14 years old and thriving in college, but that was only the beginning of her higher education. We'll tell you the moves Pangea is planning next. New curbing to curb speeding. It's what's happening to a busy neighborhood street on the Boise bench, and it has some drivers confused, but some residents thrilled. For all the incredible promise of Boise, our current administration is mired in crisis, waste, and drift. Former Boise Police Chief Mike Masterson wasting little time and mincing few words in attacking Boise's current mayor, Lauren McLean. Masterson saying such things in his official announcement of his campaign to become Boise's next mayor. It's been Boise's worst kept secret over the last several months, but now it is real and it is on. And Joe Paris is on now following the mayor's race for us. Joe, what does this announcement mean for today and going forward? Well, I, Brian, as you mentioned, maybe the worst kept secret in town, but it's on now, whether you had heard a rumor or not, Mike Masterson, he's in the race. And thinking back to 2019, that was the last race for Boise mayor. What a different world we live in now. Anyways, uh, the question from today is, what type of campaign will Mr. Masterson run? The retired BPD chief has some obvious inroads into the conversation about why he thinks he should be mayor. The topic of Boise police, of course, being one of them. Masterson was chief for a decade, 2005, retiring in 2015. And at his event today, Masterson made it clear he thinks the current mayor and her staff is not meeting the mark. Here are some thoughts from Masterson's prepared speech. As you can see here, large gallery of supporters. You probably recognize a few of them. The crisis in our city government is not simply a matter of the wrong priorities. It is a crisis of transparency and trust. We are faced with a mayor who has failed to develop strong working relationships with city, county, and state officials who has increased her office budget 60% during the last three years, who has approved hundreds of thousands of dollars of expenditures without council approval, who has hidden her travel records, who has hidden tort claims, who has lost senior personnel at an alarming rate. It is clear this mayor kicks the can on every issue, lacking foresight, skills, and determination to bring about real change. Again, that was Mike Masterson, who has now joined the campaign here. And there was no opportunity, though, for the media to ask questions of Masterson today. He gave his prepared speech, and that was that. But in remarks, Masterson did key on in his ability to lead Boise police as a qualification for mayor. Again, he had a large workforce and budget to handle from 2005 to 2015. He also spoke extensively about the recent turmoil there, highlighting a major point of his campaign, regaining public trust in Boise police and the officers out on the street. So clear criticism of the mayor, which was, of course, expected in a campaign like this. And speaking of the mayor, Mayor McLean, as we have mentioned, she is running again for a second term. You may remember she beat former mayor Dave Beter in a 2019 runoff. And Brian, I know people might be wondering you know, what's going to happen. Does she have a response? Well, we're going to hear from Mayor McLean specifically about her campaign and run for office coming up in June. And again, Mr. Masterson did not answer questions today. His campaign said he was not doing interviews. So the follow up questions we had, maybe some more of the direction specific plans he had on these hot topics. It's a wait and see for now. All right, and right there in the front row of today's announcement, former Mayor Dave Beter. He was the first person to shake his hand after his remarks. All right, thank you very much, Joe. Okay, so guess who didn't show up for his court hearing today? I'll give you two guesses, and I'll tell you there are two correct answers. I'll even give you a clue, because we're calling this, I don't know, let's call it accounting for Ammon. Yes, there was supposed to be a hearing on a trial setting for an anti-government activist and former candidate for governor, Ammon Bundy, today. That was supposed to happen at 4 o'clock related to the St. Luke's defamation lawsuit against him. And as he told us yesterday, probably not going to get there because, well, he says he's out of the country. I would have also accepted the answer Diego Rodriguez, since Bundy's friend and co-defendant in this lawsuit has also not shown up for any hearings, court dates, or depositions. He had a motion for contempt hearing this afternoon as well because attorneys for St. Luke's claim Diego continues to harass witnesses and violate other court orders. Diego obviously did not show. An Ada County judge, Lynn Norton, issued a warrant of attachment, a civil warrant for his arrest. Same boat as Bundy, although she set bail for Diego at $20,000. Bundy's was only $10,000. So more motions granted and more paperwork to be delivered to both Diego and Bundy.
The lawsuit has already been decided, by the way, with Judge Norton, Norton giving a default judgment to St. Luke since neither Ammon or Diego has shown up or participated in any aspect of this lawsuit. That trial, though, will be set and or is set and is supposed to decide damages. It's tentatively set for July 10th. Odds that either show up for that one? For those who live on the Boise bench, construction, either housing or road, has become a way of life. Well, in a growing city like Boise, it's really not surprising. But this morning, there was a new phase of a years-long project that got the attention of one Sean Kimmel. And he said, hey, ACHD, what is this latest abomination on our city streets? And Sean took a picture of what was happening on Kootenai Street. And he said, did someone misread the plans? Two sets of these have been installed half a block apart on Kootenai, just east of Orchard. If you've driven that street, you probably know what he's talking about, or if you've driven it in the last couple of days. And yeah, you probably look at that and go, that's got to be a mistake. Are those going to be bus stops? Well, Sean also asked another question on social media today. How are two cars going opposite directions supposed to get through this at the same time? Well, Sean, let us show you the idea of all this chicanery on Kootenai. There's new construction on Kootenai Street. Looks like I'm going to have three. We've had to send them all. Which means another day of work for Michael Spence. Today, probably, let me see. Who's been out here today? About six hours. His job. Last is a Ford Red Truck. Is to redirect traffic. I'll be your Ford Red Truck. While others work to, well, redirect traffic. Um, right now they're building these little islands, and that's where we're, uh, I have no idea what they're doing with the islands. The islands are part of a years-long plan to alter this alternate route to Overland Road. Yeah, they got sidewalks now, and before you never had sidewalks before, and it's pretty nice. These new curbs are called chicanes, and their job is to calm traffic on this Kootenai cut-through. It's what residents wanted because they say the 25 mile an hour speed limit is largely ignored. Well, yeah, it's, it's just ridiculous. I, you know, the speeding, my God, you wouldn't believe it. You think this will help? It's got to help, cut it down to one lane. Then they can speed up till they hit the next one. And that's the idea, to force drivers to slow down because at some point, they're gonna have to share the road. A sort of chicane game of chicken yeah, so, okay, so when two cars meet, like we're seeing here, what's supposed to happen? One of them's going to have to give. <laughs> Cause some fist fights or something, I don't know. Or banging up some fenders, I'm damn if I know. There's going to be a couple crashes, you think? Oh, yeah. It's, yeah, you bet. Only time will tell with that. But for those who live here, it's about time for this. So somebody's going to have to sort of give, you know, be polite and not be in such a big darn hurry. Which is the goal? Well, you got to slow them down somewhere. So ACHD told us today this is part of a $2.3 million project that goes back to 2017 when neighbors complained about the number of cars and the speeding on Kootenai, and they wanted something done about it. But most didn't want speed bumps, mostly because it would make it more difficult for emergency vehicles. So they went with these chicanes, which coincidentally also means trickery. By the way, ACHD did a traffic study on Kootenai back in 2015 to see how many cars use it and how fast they go on it. You know what they found? With a radar gun, they found the average speed on Kootenai was 27 miles an hour, which is only two miles over the speed limit. Talk about some, that's some chicanery, right?
actually kind of hard because I really didn't know anyone. She's had situations where her classmates kind of look at her and be like, there's no way that this, you know, this kid's, you know, belongs here. I think I'd be going into ninth grade. I'm taking electromagnetic theory. Um, I'm taking linear algebra, studying biophysics and electrophysiology and that kind of thing. Words that most of us can't even say. What were you doing at 17 years old? Maybe kind of wondering what kind of shoes you're going to wear to prom? Even the brightest of us were probably just starting to look ahead, ponder what's next for life after high school. But calling Pangea Finn one of Boise's brightest is certainly an understatement. And so what you just heard right there was from a story we did four years ago with her. That's when she was at Boise State at 14 years old. She's now 17 years old and holds two bachelor's degrees. So what is she doing now? Well, she's probably scratching her head over what to pack because if you want to get a PhD from, I don't know, say Harvard, you got to move to Cambridge. Who are also going to Ivy School. Students work their whole lives to graduate on the blue. Yeah. But Pangea Finn did it a little faster. I'm 17 right now. Yeah, she's pretty put together. Have you had to deal with just like an onslaught of jokes about like Pangea, the supercontinent? No. Really? Most of the people who would joke about that kind of thing don't know what it is, <laughs> honestly. But I do. <laughs> you think so? Yeah. And Pangea's um, way ahead of her time. So it's pretty complicated. Um, I have two degrees from Boise State as of last week. Uh, I got my bachelor's of music in piano performance and my bachelor's of science in physics and math. Are you keeping track? So that meant I was doing three majors while I was at Boise State. And she finished them in five years. She's attended BSU since she was 13, but to break away at her own pace, she had to prove it. I was really young. <laughs> I think I was about five or maybe even four. Trying to go to preschool, one of the things that they would have the kids do was play Hi Ho Cherio. And Hi Ho Cherio is a game that is incredibly easy to rig and beat wholesale. I would be always winning these games and I wouldn't end up getting along with the other kids. And so then I would. Eventually, I just ended up leaving, and I would go into the teacher's office and read whatever chapter books they had in there for hours during preschool. So you were a card counter at the blackjack table in preschool? Yeah. That was kind of a running theme. Either a school wouldn't know how to educate me, or they would be very confident that the way to educate me was to j just put me in the same place as the other kids who were my age and see what happened. So you kind of have a streak of proving people wrong, I guess. That's the plan. It's a plan that's worked but a plan with backlash. Mostly it's just the systemic ageism that's inherent in the education system. And a lot of gifted kids who are accelerated and some who aren't have had to fight the system every step of the way to get where they are. Social aspects get talked about a lot in education of gifted students, especially the kind of people who try to stop these students from accelerating are always very, very concerned about what it will do to their social life. <sighs> I did not really have that problem. I feel like a lot of that problem is pretty fabricated. You don't but, think you're uh, losing anything? No, I don't. I've seen the things that I'm losing, like high school, I don't want to deal with that social situation. That looks like a mess. No, Pangea belongs here, but she can't stay here. Not anymore. So I have been accepted into the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Harvard. There are a lot of opportunities there that I'd always hoped to be able to explore, but some of them weren't available at Boise State. You've outgrown Boise State University. A lot of people don't get to Boise State University. I am kind of sad to think of it that way because Boise State has been my home for five years and they've been so amazing to me in so many ways. I'm really gonna miss this place. While this is home, Pangea's worked her whole life for this. Tough to remember. Way ahead of her time. Um, I was here at, on campus when I found out about Harvard. And the way that I found out was that a professor called me and congratulated me for getting in. A professor from Harvard who was so excited to see me there that he had taken the time to reach out. That was when I really saw that Harvard was going to give me the same welcoming environment that I had at Boise State. and that in large part is actually what drew me there.
Pangea says she is working toward her PhD in physics, but she doesn't know what she wants to quite do yet for a living. Remember, she's just 17 years old, but a large part of her experience, Brian, talking about ageism, the yeah. word that she used, she gave a good example. When she was 13 and she first started, okay. she was doing research. You have to be 14 to work a job in Idaho and get paid. So she had to volunteer for the research she was doing wow. at BSU. She has a friend in another state. I believe it's somewhere in the Midwest. Uh, this friend is in grad school. They're not old enough to work in that state either. So they have to pay their own way through grad school because usually you get compensated for tuition through your research. Right. It's a whole thing. And people who are gifted students like her, other people just don't understand that kind of stuff. And the whole social aspect of being a kid genius. I mean, they find their own people. Yeah, and a lot of it is other people in that community as well. She does say sometimes other students in class kind of look down on her like you're just a kid. Well, then she helps them with their homework and then they're friends after that. Uh, so. That's how it works. That's how I did it. Oh, sure. We'll be right back. Well, our Tuesday hasn't been much to look at, unfortunately, with the cloud cover and overcast skies that have been hovering for most of the day, but still it's been pretty comfy. We're at 73 degrees in the city of trees. We may tack on one more degree before the day is done. Winds a lot lighter than yesterday, but still those northwest winds have been a bit refreshing at times. We've had a couple little sprinkles pop up in the Treasure Valley, but for the most part, it's been dry. Not the case for Twin Falls. Look at the storms that are rolling through right now, coming almost straight from south to north. We have heavy storms rolling through Pocatello right now. Lots of lightning strikes. People likely hunkering down there waiting for the storms to pass. And as we look at the rest of our evening here in Boise, we will stay dry and comfortable. Mostly cloudy overnight, dipping down to the low 60s by midnight. West Central Mountains heads up a decent chance of showers and storms each and every afternoon. All the way through Memorial Day weekend, they'll be hit or miss. Kind of pop up storms, but still it is happening. And we also have a chance of storms each and every afternoon in the valleys as well well through Sunday. Temperatures though comfortable will be up near 80 degrees in Boise again by Thursday. 
We are continuing our excavation of KTVB archives all to celebrate the 70th anniversary coming up this July. Today we're going to take you to Ketchum back in May of 1994 where figure skaters new and old preparing for the Sun Valley summer ice shows. Yeah, that's a summer show on ice. D. Sarton takes us there. The beautiful Sun Valley Lodge is the backdrop for the only year-round outdoor ice skating ring in the country. Skaters here are inspired by the spectacular scenery and the fresh mountain air. This setting has been attracting people from around the world since the resort was built back in 1937. The brainchild of railroad tycoon Averill Harriman, Sun Valley was to become the first destination ski area in the United States. The Grand Resort became the winter playground for scores of famous Hollywood stars. The first Sun Valley ice shows featured hotel staff workers and guests who were given a costume and a pair of skates to perform. At about the same time those shows were getting started, the queen of ice skating, Sonia Henney, had just won her third Olympic gold medal. In the late 30s, she began her movie career and skated into the hearts of millions with the filming of the movie Sun Valley Serenade. The popularity of ice skating quickly soared to new heights. Nick Marisich, the director of today's ice shows, remembers his unique childhood growing up in Sun Valley. My dad was director of skating here for 30 years. You can grow up here as a kid, and really the world comes to see you if you live here. I came into contact with all the world's greatest skaters. It was, just, it was wonderful, it really was. Nick joined the Walt Disney World of Ice Follies and toured the world for 10 years. That's where he met his wife, Linda Fradiani, an Olympic and world champion skater. After seeing the world, Nick and Linda decided to make Sun Valley their home. I like it here best. Uh, this is where I choose to live. That's what brought me back. And each year, the stars keep coming back to this famous rink as well. The original tradition of the annual Sun Valley Ice Show continues to bring in the world's best skaters. Gia Gadat is the choreographer and artistic director for the Sun Valley Ice Show. One, two, three, four, bevel, one. She and two, local three, student performers four, one, work two, weeks in advance four. getting ready for the annual summer right. season. Okay, let me all see you try it double time. Some of the local skaters will get a chance to perform with the professional skaters and some of the production numbers. We're getting started on the choreography early so they can get a feel of it before all the professional skaters come in. For us to be out here in the summer skating outside is just incredible. You come here for a vacation and then you can get introduced to skating. A lot of the little kids see the professional skaters out there skating and they decide that's what they'd like to do. And that's how it was for Trina Pierre, who has skated in the ice show since she was a little girl. We came for vacation to ski, and I saw the ice rink outside, and I always loved watching it on television. So I told my mom I wanted to come here and ice skate, and so she got me a few lessons, and I just loved it so much. It started from there. All the history, relaxed atmosphere, and friendly people attract world-class athletes. The likes of 1994 gold medalist Oksana Bayul and silver medalist Nancy Kerrigan. Scott Hamilton, four-time U.S. and world champion and an Olympic gold medalist himself, always steals the show. All right, well, you happened to be around the Sun Valley Resort this past spring. You probably noticed the ice was gone. It was all ripped up. They're making some improvements. The Sun Valley Ice Shows, they say they're back this summer starting on July 3rd with Olympic skater Mariah Bell. Tickets for those shows are going to go on sale. And then uh, as for the director of skating, Nick Marchitz, well, it looks like he might be in real estate in Ketchum now. And the coaches there you saw, still coaching, still choreographing, skating at Sun Valley. Maybe, maybe if you show up, you might get to see some of them this summer.
Just a few moments left on this Tuesday. Let's get to your comments. Mr. Masterson at the age of 68 should continue to enjoy his retirement. And forget about running for mayor. It's time for old white guys to just sit down. OK, how about this one? At some point, will Bundy and company ever have to comply with the law? I'm beginning to wonder, says Jack and Boyce. You remember, this is a civil case, not a criminal case. So I guess the question is how much taxpayer money are willing to spend on a civil case for something that would require a lot of resources, too. ACHD stands for absolute chaos, havoc, and disruption, says Carol. There's a few of those out there. The 27-mile-an-hour average is fine. It's the two idiots racing at 60 to 70 miles an hour that makes this a problem and that, well, we'll solve that, says Larry.